Hi everyone, my name is Jans and I am the first speaker for today. My topic is the AI race and how to avoid tragedy. So just give me a second to get set up here. Cool. Um, yeah, so the, I just want to say that we do have pizzas coming and they'll be here during my talk at some point. Um, we hopefully we'll have some during the intermission. Um, otherwise, please feel free to grab yourself some refreshments. I see most of you have ready, so we're good in that department. Um, all right, the AI race, 2023. So the agenda for today, uh, for my talk, is very briefly the ongoing AI race. What is it? Who's participating in it? Um, similar races and how they've ended, other technologies, the golden rules of humane technology, um, the impending AI powered tragedy, and then how to prevent it. These sound pretty drastic, but I'll uh, probably should explain them as we go on. Um, first, a bit about me I am a software engineer, but I do have training in philosophy, so I do have a degree in, in philosophy. And my graduate project was in uh, computer ethics. So I know the thing to talk about, talking about here. Cool. First of all, what is, what is the AI race? Basically, at the end of 2022, ChatGPT released, well, OpenAI released its platform, ChatGPT. We've all used it by now, I'm sure. It's a fantastic um, AI model, language model that you can use to give prompts to and receive responses back, and every response you receive back is generated by the model and is unique. And it's a wonderful tool, and it's you, and it's very popular. How popular is it? ChatGPT reached 100 million users in two months. Facebook took four and a half years to get to that same number. So, super popular. Um, obviously, big tech, didn't think twice before starting to do the same thing, right? Google introduced their own um, <laughs> version of the same idea called Google Bard. Uh, Microsoft made a thing called 365 Copilot, which is essentially a language model uh, injected into your office apps. So Excel, Word, PowerPoint, those kind of things. You can say, hey, Copilot, please um, spruce up my PowerPoint slides and it just does it for you. Uh, GitHub has made Copilot, which is uh, again used as a language model to give you um, suggestions on how to write code, and writes methods for you, write documentation for you. Uh, Meta, which formerly known as Facebook, has a system called DeepText, which is their own language model that they use to understand the posts that users have written, and that they use for data collection, target advertising, that kind of thing. And then Amazon Bedrock is an uh, AWS system uh, which also provides um, software as a service type language model uh, capabilities to, to companies willing to pay for it. So Big Tech obviously is very much invested in, the, in this, this AI thing, but it's not just Big Tech. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of small companies have started to, uh, have started to, to join, the, join the party. So, for example, Lumen5 is a video content creator. It's insane. You should see what it can do. You put a bunch of like unedited video clips in, and you say, hey, please edit this like a podcast. And then it just automatically goes and cuts at the right places and like, makes sure the audio overlaps properly. It's amazing. Sound Raw is an AI powered music creator. This is a screenshot from the system. It's, it's you, know, you can just say like what genre you want, what tempo you want. And then parts of the song, you can say, I want this part of the song to be high energy, and I want this part of the song to be low energy, and it just figures out what you mean, and it just generates a song for you. Um, Luca is a AI powered logo generator. I just generated some logos for GDG Cape Town, just for the fun of it. This took me all of five seconds. Um, Podcastle does audio editing, deep nostalgia. Um, is a company that animates static images. So over here, this is just a photo um, from uh, many years ago before the current camera was invented. And they are able to animate this woman's face. Okay, this is a static picture, but they are able to animate the woman's face such that it looks like she's actually breathing and, 
I'm speaking and looking at you. Um, and there are various others. So obviously, um, this AI, so Chelsea, um, so obviously, this AI company, uh, this AI system, uh, has definitely impacted um, the, the world, and it has followed a race. And I'll talk about what, what I mean by the race. But uh, as you can see, there are a lot of companies that are competing right now to get their AI products onto the market and to get users. So that's. I want to talk about some other races just to give you an idea of what I mean by a tech race. Um, so Infinite Scroll is a technology that was invented by a person called Azam Raskin in 2006 and it's currently used by about 5 million people, let's say, let's say the estimate is. It's obviously used in a myriad of apps. Most apps actually these days have some form of Infinite Scroll in it. The original intention of Infinite Scroll was to help people find things. So the idea was that Infinite Scroll was supposed to be an alternative to the page by page search results that you see on, for example, Google or Gumtree or whenever you do a search. Um, so the idea was just that you don't have to click on the next page, you can just keep scrolling. What Azar didn't realize is the reality of this scroll, which is that attention companies started a race. Um, so when I say attention companies, this is a, a term used in tech to describe companies that profit from your attention. So TikTok, Facebook, Twitter are great examples because they, the longer you stay on the app, the more attention you give it, the more they profit. So they're typically referred to as attention companies. And they benefit a lot from this technology called um, Infinite Scroll. Uh, the, even though the intention was very positive, the reality is quite negative. Um, we all know what doom scrolling is, right? We just keep on scrolling mindlessly, not absorbing any of the content that comes in, but still getting those dopamine hits, keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling. They estimate that about 200,000 human lifetimes in hours it is wasted per day thanks to infant scroll. Um, and you know what's really sad about infant scroll? Is that it doesn't actually even make money. So um, it's bad for advertisers because the content that you see while scrolling mindlessly is extremely forgettable. It's in the name, it's mindless, right? So um, most, um, so that's advertisers. Then creators, so for example, TikTok get paid extremely little. You can research this. It's like a known issue, but it's uh, if you compare it to trying to make a documentary, it's it's uh, extremely low pay and um, not great for. For, for having people invest in making the content. And Susan Lee, who is the CFO of Meta, has said that Reels, Instagram Reels, uh, reduces revenue. And the reason why is because it distracts people from the from Facebook's bigger revenue models, which is ads shown in the normal timeline in the feeds. So that's the infinite scroll. Um, another example is on demand food delivery. Uh, Uber Eats, Swiss Delivery, uh, DoorDash, all those companies. The idea behind on demand food delivery is very quick and easy access to food. It sounds awesome, it sounds like a perfect thing. The reality is it's actually quite negative. Um, so, Mustache, uh, I actually went and looked at Mustache financial statements and their food delivery services. Uh, so, sorry, Mustache, by the way, owns Take A Lot, which owns Mr. Delivery. Um, the Nuspatch has said that their food delivery losses have doubled to 724 million in FY2022. Um, FY financial year, by the way, so they're losing a lot of money out of it. Uber has reported losses of about $3 per order internationally for Uber Eats. DoorDash made a 171 million deficit in Q1. Uber Eats drivers themselves, so that's the companies, but the drivers themselves, it's known, cannot make ends meet just normal hours, they often have to work over time, a lot of over time, to keep, um, to keep, to make ends meet. So, you might wonder why, if this loses so much money, are people actually still investing in this? And the reason is market dominance. So, Take A Lot has uh, a lot to gain from just owning a market, and the same story with Uber Eats, and the same story with Chicken 6060, and the same story with Mr. D. They all are willing to go through these losses just to own the share of the market so that possibly one day they can up the prices and actually start to make a profit. 
I'm going to talk more about what this means in the context of tech races in a second. But first, I'd like to talk about the three rules of humane technology. So there's this amazing organization called the Center for Humane Technology, and their purpose is to make technology work for us, not the other way around. And that's a very broad thing, but essentially they talk to legislators, they do lobbying, they talk to engineers, they um, have podcasts, they have all kinds of um, social um, initiatives with the purpose of making technology more humane, reducing the risk of food spoiling and making horrible losses and making technology have these negative impacts that I spoke about. So they've devised these three rules for humane technology that if any technologist that's probably most of us in this room, um, follow, will end up with technology that's pretty solid and, and humane. So the rules are that if you invent a new technology, that means that there are new responsibilities that go with our associate with it. I'll talk about examples now, but essentially, when you invent a new technology, there are new responsibilities, and you need to identify what they are, and you need to name them so that it's clear to you. Number two, if the technology confers power, it starts a race. Um, what that means is if your technology allows you to have some sort of power over people or over competitors, then it's going to start a race because everyone is going to get that power. And number three is uncoordinated races end in tragedy. And I'll talk about what that means <laughs> in a second. So new tech means new responsibilities. Uh, it may be very unclear what those responsibilities are. So take Infinite Spark, for example. The original intention is better search, so just more convenient search experience. The risk is weaponized mindlessness, which is very not obvious, not clear at all. But as we see, that is in fact what happened with Infinite Spark, is people are, or companies are incentivized to just keep people on the app without actually giving them great content. And the responsibility that is associated with infinite scroll is mindful use of technology. Make sure that people don't actually scroll infinitely, even though it is possible. Another example, food delivery. So the intention is quick and easy access to food. The risk, as we saw, is underpaying drivers, huge losses, and unrealistic delivery costs. You know, you can, you can well, there was a point last year where you can to a great delivery for like five and that is completely setting the wrong expectation in consumers' minds. But now, as soon as you push it up to a realistic price, like 50 grand or 100 grand, people are not going to pay it. So in order to stay competitive, <laughs> companies have to push down their delivery price, which is what leads to these losses and underpaying of drivers. Rule number two, power starts a race. So if technology confers power, it starts a race. So in the infinite scroll, the power conferred is attention. If, you have, if your app has infinite scroll, it means you'll be able to get people's attention more, longer, which means that if you're competing with, a, with an app that has infinite scroll, then you have to have it as well. A race has started. Everyone needs to have infinite scroll, because if you don't have it, you fall behind in the race. Um, the race, of course, is for market share. And same story with food delivery. Uh, the power of the is free to go home. It, without the apps, you would need to go to a grocery store, right? With the apps, you can just get it delivered straight to your home. And if you are a grocery store, like Checkers or Big Bang, and you don't have an app, you're going to lose out on that market share. So they have to get an app, and they have to have these problems that I spoke about the, um, the, the unrealistic delivery costs and so on. Rule number three, an uncoordinated race ends in tragedy. So in this case, tragedy refers to the tragedy of the commons. In philosophy, we talk about the tragedy of the commons, and what it means is that every individual participating has like, beautiful intentions. All they want is just a better society for everyone, a more convenient experience. But together, if everyone does the same thing, we have this problem. And so when I talk about tragedy as being societal doom scrolling, underpaying drivers, poor expectations of delivery costs, that kind of thing. Um, 
uh, yeah, every country, every company just wants a little market share, but the intense competition between all the companies leads to this outcome that no one wants. And that's important. No, no one company wants this outcome, right? Like I'm sure people at Facebook don't want society to scroll for like one minute. See, it's just they have to do it because we're in this race now. And in order to stay ahead of the race, you need to implement these. Okay, cool. So these are the rules, the three rules of humane technology. Um, I would like to talk now about what this means for the AI race. So the infinite scrolling race and the free delivery race is pretty much done, you could say. Like it's pretty much, it's come to um, a plateau now. But the AI race is still pretty fresh and we still have a lot of new companies spawning every day, a lot of new technologies coming up every day. And the AI race is not done, it's actually just getting started. So that's why it's important to talk about the, um, the, rules, the rules of humane technology before we reach the tragedy of the immigrants. New tech means new responsibilities. So here are some more concrete cases. Kodak started mass producing cameras back in whenever it was. Um, and this conferred the need for privacy. So before Kodak started mass producing cameras, no constitution in the world had a right to privacy in it. But it's after taking photos was easy and publicly accessible that we had to invent this new right, the right to privacy, and start enforcing it. Right? Similar story when the digital storage became cheap. Right? Back in the day, if you went online shopping or whatever, the, the, the retailer had to delete your information at some point just because it was so expensive to store information. And it's gotten a lot cheaper now for gigabyte to store info, which means that we had to invent this thing called the right to be forgotten. You know, I've heard about it. It's um, the GDPR is very good with this. It's basically in most sites that you visit, you are rightfully allowed to send them an email and say, hey, please delete all my data that you have on me. And they have to be before the right to be forgotten, that was unheard of, right? Companies would just store data on you forever. Um, so we have this thing called the policy vacuum, which is uh, the, the lack of policies around these new technologies. So here, the policies have been set, right? The need for privacy, the right to be forgotten. Here, the policies have not been set yet. So another example is the retweet button, right? Very innocent thing. On Twitter and just retweet and just shares, and shares whatever information with the people that follow you. Um, this has obviously, this says, as you know, during COVID led to the rampant spread of misinformation. Um, uh, it's also uh, led to uncontrolled censorship, which means um, it relates to shadow banning. Uh, shadow banning, if you don't know, is a term used in, in tech that means you are effectively banning the user from sharing content, but not actually. So the user can't see that they're banned. They can still share content, but that content won't actually be shared with anyone. And just, the user just thinks that it's being shared. That's called shadow banning. And Twitter does this, Facebook does this, this is known, this is not rumors. And uh, essentially, it's just like an alternative to a normal ban that is like less controversial. But there's no regulation around it. So Twitter and Facebook can, can shadow ban whoever they want to, and there's no like law that backs up like people and say, hey, you can't shadow ban me uh, just because I have something conservative to say, for example. Um, so there's no policy around that at the moment, which is why we call it a policy vacuum. And then the actual thing that you probably want to hear about is generative models, right? Or AI. So um, an example of the, the kind of issues that we could see with, with AI is that it's extremely easy to generate art in the style of a particular artist. So you can very easily go to Dali, which is another open AI project, and you can say, hey, um, generate me a, a portrait of Nelson Mandela in the style of Vincent van Gogh, and it'll just do it for you. And you can do that with any artist you want, and with these um, music apps that I showed you, same thing with music, generate me a song about love in the style of Taylor Swift. And the question is, 
Who owns that copyright? Right? It's not clear that it should be Taylor Swift, who is, isn't really her work, but then again, it sort of is her work. Um, so the copyright at the moment, it's completely legal to do this, to generate a song that sounds like a Taylor Swift song, release it under your own name, and make tons of money. There's no, it's completely legal at the moment. And we, that is another sort of policy value, because we probably want to be clear about who owns the copyright in these scenarios. When is it, when is it a limit of legal laws? And how do we pay out pay into that? Um, the second rule is power starts a race. So AI confers the power of productivity. This is extremely clear, right? Pretty much every white color job in the world can be made more productive with AI. If you're a developer, then I can help you write code. If you're a, a magazine author, for example, then I can help you write some articles. If you're in finance, then I can help you make all your spreadsheets. Um, I can help you figure out formulas for spreadsheets. Um, if you're I don't know, in the event management, then I can help you write emails to people the nice like the possibilities are endless. If your job involves a computer, you can be more productive with AI. And that is how the race starts. Because now if company X uses AI for their work and company Y doesn't, then very quickly company Y is going to use out the market share. So let's make this a little bit more practical. Say we're all of us are developers here. So say for example um, your company Let's say, let's say, for example, Electrum has a policy that says we're not allowed to use AI because it's probably copyright infringement, we don't stand for that. But then we have a competitor that does use AI, and obviously if they use AI, they can run <laughs> quicker, they can test quicker, they can deploy quicker, which means that they can onboard customers quicker. So that means that customers are going to be more likely to uh, integrate with them than with us. That means that we'll lose our market share over time, unless participate in the race. So if we lift the band and say, okay, electron developers are not allowed to use AI, then we're competitive again. So, and that's, that's just that. Then there's pretty much every other white color on the planet has the exact same story. So, power, so AI confers a power of collectivity, and that means that all tech companies, not just tech companies, all white color companies will soon want to share. The individual goal is so okay, from the so that's the perspective of a user of AI. From the perspective of a company that's developing AI software, it's a similar story, right? Um, you, if you, for example, are like Microsoft, you've now implemented Microsoft Copilot, right? So now there's AI in your Word documents and PowerPoints. If you're Google Slides, Google Docs, and you don't have AI, then people are going to switch over to Microsoft, right? So they're just more productive then. So Google now has to participate in this race and invent their own AI alternative to Copilot, which allows you to integrate AI into your PowerPoints and into your documents and so on. And um, the individual goal for these tech companies is just to be the AI tool of choice, which is not that horrible of a goal, but as I as I explained in the previous time, you still have this, this um, problem of uh, the tragedy of the commons, where if everyone does this, then everyone has to do this. Um, I think the next slide has a better example of what an uncoordinated AI race means. So, um, the Center for Humane Technology did the study about what it, uh, the working environment of AI ethicists, and they report burnout across the board. In all companies, Google, Meta, Twitter, they have these people called AI ethicists, like safe AI developers or what have you. And the idea is it's just a department that's dedicated to um, ensuring that AI is developed in a safe and responsible way. In reality, these people uh, report burnout are very ineffective because, of course, companies have a profit incentive, but ethicists have a safety incentive. And then when those two clash, these things go, we're not. It's going to be the employer. Right? So we have this problem where ethicists can't really do anything because the profit incentive is so strong. Um, 
AI is being embedded in software without truly really understanding parts. So like I said, you can already just generate music or art in a style of a particular artist and there's no copyright infringement there. We have a similar issue with AI being embedded in arbitrary software like in our IDEs or in our document processors, in our card process. We don't know what the harms are of that. People just gonna copy each other's slides, like are you gonna be able to see sensitive information because someone else liked something in a slide and the AI learned from it and I was putting it in the slide. Like we just don't know what the possible harms are here. Uh, we're all just racing for the comments. And at the moment there's zero coordination between companies. We have organizations like the Center for Humane Technology, which is awesome, but the companies themselves, like Google, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, all of those, they are not coordinating and uncoordinated race and tragedy. So what's the solution? Um, coordinate, that's what I say. Uh, one ethics committee and one company can't do everything. We need to coordinate. Uh, I just imagine imagine if industry coordinated. Imagine if we all just said, hey, let's just not develop any AI software for like three months, we just have a conference on AI ethics, we we'll all participate, all well, everyone, Google, Facebook, AWS, everyone joins the table and we sit down and talk about what can go wrong here. We just coordinate. We have a much better chance of not getting another tragedy as we did with the infant scroll and as we did with the Think about what new responsibilities you uh, are conferred with AI. Understand the power of the technology. Get ahead of the race and go ahead. That's what I say the solution is. All right, that comes, that uh, brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, a special thanks to the GDG Tech Town for bringing some of these wonderful people to get onto the event. And I also want to mention a special thanks for the Center of Human Technology, which inspired this talk. That's why I gave me the and of course, electric. Thank you. Thank you very much.